Section number 52 of Sermons on Several Occasions, Second Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sermons on Several Occasions, Second Series, by John Wesley. Sermon 105, On Conscience. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. Second Corinthians number one verse twelve. How few words are there in the world more common than this? Conscience. It is in almost every one's mouth, and one would thence be apt to conclude that no word can be found which is more generally understood. But it may be doubted whether this is the case or no, although numberless treatises have been written upon it. For it is certain a great part of those writers have rather puzzled the cause than cleared it that they have usually darkened counsel by uttering words without knowledge. The best treatise on the subject which I remember to have seen is translated from the French Mont Plaché, which describes in a clear and rational manner the nature and offices of conscience. But, though it were published nearly a hundred years ago, it is in very few hands, and indeed a greater part of those that have read it complain of the length of it an octavo volume of several hundred pages upon so plain a subject was likely to prove a trial of patience to most persons of understanding it seems therefore there is still wanting a discourse upon the subject short as well as clear this by the assistance of god i will endeavour to supply by showing first the nature of conscience and then the several sorts of it after which i shall conclude with a few important directions and first I am to show the nature of conscience. This is a very pious man in the last century, in his sermon on universal conscientiousness, described in the following manner. This word, which literally signifies knowing with another, excellently sets forth the scriptural notion of it. So Job 16 verse 19, my witness is in heaven. And so the apostle Romans 9 verse 1. I say the truth, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. In both places is it as if he said, God witnesseth my conscience. Conscience is placed in the middle under God and above man. It is a kind of silent reasoning of the mind, whereby those things which are judged to be right are approved of with pleasure, but those which are judged evil are disapproved of with uneasiness. This is a tribunal in the breast of men to accuse sinners, and excuse them that do well. To view it in a somewhat different light, conscience, as well as the Latin word from which it is taken, and the Greek word sineadisos, necessarily imply the knowledge of two or more things together. Suppose the knowledge of our words and actions, and at the same time of their goodness or badness, if it be not rather the faculty whereby we know all at once our actions and the quality of them. Conscience, then, is that faculty whereby we are at once conscious of our own thoughts, words, and actions, and of their merit or demerit, of their being good or bad, and consequently deserving either praise or censure. And some pleasure generally attends the former sentence, some uneasiness the latter. But this varies exceedingly, according to education and a thousand other circumstances. Can it be denied that something of this is found in every man born into this world? And does it not appear as soon as the understanding opens, as soon as reason begins to dawn? Does not every one, then, begin to know that there is a difference between good and evil? How imperfect soever the various circumstances of this sense of good and evil may be? Does not every man, for instance, know, unless blinded by the prejudices of education, like the inhabitants of the Cape of Good Hope, that it is good to honor his parents? Do not all men, however uneducated or barbarous, allow it is right to do to others as we would have them do to us? And are not all who know this condemned in their own mind when they do anything contrary thereto? As, on the other hand, when they act suitable thereto, they have the approbation of their own conscience. This faculty seems to be what is usually meant by those who speak of natural conscience an expression frequently found in some of our best authors, but yet not strictly just, for though in one sense it may be termed natural, because it is found in all men, yet properly speaking it is not natural, but a supernatural gift of God, above all his natural endowments. 
No, it is not nature, but the Son of God, that is the, quote, true light, which enlighteneth every man that cometh into the world, unquote. So that we may say to every human creature, quote, He, not nature, hath showed thee, O man, what is good, unquote. And it is his spirit who giveth thee an inward check, who causes thee to feel uneasy when thou walkest in any instance contrary to the light which he hath given thee. If I may give a peculiar force to that beautiful passage to consider by whom and on what occasion the words were uttered, the persons speaking are Balak, the king of Moab, and Balaam, then under divine impressions, it seems then not far from the kingdom of God, although he afterwards so foully revolted. Probably Balak, too, at that time, experienced something of the same influence. This occasioned his consulting with or asking counsel of Balaam. His proposing the question to which Balaam gives so full an answer, Micah 6, verse 5, ff, quote, O my people, saith the prophet in the name of God, remember what Balak the king of Moab consulted, it seems, in the fullness of his heart, and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him, Wherewith, saith he, shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Unquote. This the kings of Moab had actually done, on occasions of deep distress, a remarkable account of which is recorded in the third chapter of the second book of Kings. To this Balaam makes that noble reply, being, doubtless, then taught by God, quote, he hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? To take a more distinct view of conscience, it appears to have a threefold office. First, it is a witness, testifying what we have done, in thought or word or action. Secondly, it is a judge, passing sentence on what we have done, that it is good or evil. And thirdly, it, in some sort, executes this sentence, by occasioning a degree of complacency in him that does well, and a degree of uneasiness in him that does evil. Professor Hutchinson, late of Glasgow, places conscience in a different light. In his essay on the passions, he observes that we have several senses, or natural avenues of pleasure and pain, besides the five external senses. One of these he terms the public sense, whereby we are naturally pained at the misery of a fellow creature, and pleased at his deliverance from it. And every man, says he, has a moral sense, whereby he approves of benevolence and disapproves of cruelty. Yea, he is uneasy when he himself has done a cruel action, and pleased when he has done a generous one. All this is, in some sense, undoubtedly true, but it is not true that either the public or the moral sense, both of which are included in the term conscience, is now natural to man. Whatever may have been the case at first, while man was in a state of innocence, both the one and the other is now a branch of that supernatural gift of God which we usually style preventing grace. But the professor does not at all agree with this. He sets God wholly out of the question. God has nothing to do with his scheme of virtue from the beginning to the end, so that, to say the truth, his scheme of virtue is atheism all over. This is refinement indeed. Many have excluded God out of the world. He excludes him even out of religion. But do not we mistake him? Do we take his meaning right, that it may be plain enough that no man may mistake him? He proposes this question, quote, What if a man, in doing a virtuous, that is, a generous action, in helping a fellow creature, has an eye to God, either as commanding or as promising to reward it? Then, says he, so far as he has an eye to God, the virtue of the action is lost. Whatever action springs from an eye to the recompense of reward have no virtue, no moral goodness in them. Unquote. Alas, was this man called a Christian? How unjustly was he slandered with that assertion? Even Dr. Taylor, though he does not allow Christ to be God, yet does not scruple to term him, quote, a person of consummate virtue, unquote but the professor could not allow him any virtue at all. But to return, what is conscience in the Christian sense? It is that faculty of the soul which, by the assistance of the grace of God, 
sees at one and the same time one our own tempers and lives the real nature and quality of our thoughts words and actions two the rule whereby we are to be directed and three the agreement or disagreement therewith to express it a little more largely conscience implies first the faculty a man has of knowing himself of discerning both in general and in particular his own tempers thoughts words and actions but this is not possible for him to do without the assistance of the spirit of god otherwise self-love and indeed every other irregular passion would disguise and wholly conceal him from himself it implies secondly a knowledge of the rule whereby he is to be directed in every particular which is no other than the written words of god conscience implies thirdly a knowledge that all his thoughts and words and actions are conformable to that rule it is all the offices of conscience the quote, unction of the holy one unquote, is indispensably needful without this neither can we clearly discern our lives or temper nor could we judge the rule whereby we are to walk or of our conformity or disconformity to it this is properly the account of a good conscience what may be in other terms expressed thus a divine consciousness of walking in all things according to the written word of god it seems indeed that there can be no conscience which has not a regard to god if you say yes there certainly may be a conscience of having done right or wrong without any reference to him i answer this i cannot grant i doubt whether the very words right and wrong according to the christian system do not imply in the very idea of them agreement and disagreement to the will and word of god if so there is no such thing as conscience in a christian if we leave god out of the question in order to the very existence of a good conscience as well as to the continuance of it the continued influence of the spirit of god is absolutely needful accordingly the apostle john declares to the believers of all ages ye have an unction from the holy one and ye know all things all things that are needful to your having a conscience void of offence toward god and toward man so he adds you have no need that any one should teach you otherwise than as that anointing teaches you that anointing clearly teaches us three things first the true meaning of god's words secondly our actions to remembrance and thirdly the agreement of all with the commandments of god proceed we now to consider in the second place the several sorts of conscience a good conscience has been spoken of already this saint paul expresses various ways in one place he simply terms it a good conscience towards god in another a conscience void of offence toward god and toward man but he speaks still more largely in the text our rejoicing is this the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity with a single eye and godly sincerity we have had our conversation in the world meanwhile he observes that this was done not by fleshly wisdom commonly called prudence this never did nor ever can produce such an effect but by the grace of god which alone is sufficient to work this in any child of man nearly allied to this if it be not the same place in another view or a particular branch of it is a tender conscience one of a tender conscience is exact in observing any deviation from the word of god whether in thought or word or work and immediately feels remorse and self-condemnation for it and the constant cry of his soul is oh that my tender soul may fly the first abhorred approach of ill quick as the apple of an eye the slightest touch of sin to feel but sometimes this excellent quality tenderness of conscience is carried to an extreme we find some who fear where no fear is who are continually condemning themselves without cause imagining some things to be sinful which the scripture nowhere condemns and supposing other things to be their duty which the scripture never enjoins this is properly termed a scrupulous conscience and is a sore evil it is highly expedient to yield to it as little as possible rather it is a manner of earnest prayer that you may be delivered from this sort of evil and may recover a sound mind to which nothing would contribute more than the converse of a pious and judicious friend but the extreme which is opposite to this is far more dangerous 
a hardened conscience is a thousand times more dangerous than a scrupulous one that can violate a plain command of god without any self-condemnation either doing which he has expressly forbidden or neglecting what he has expressly commanded and yet without any remorse yea perhaps glorying in this very hardness of heart many instances of this deplorable stupidity were met with at this day and even among people that suppose themselves to have no small share of religion a person is doing something which the scripture clearly forbids you ask how do you dare to do this and are answered with perfect unconcern oh my heart does not condemn me i reply so much the worse i would to god it did you would then be in a safer state than you are now it is a dreadful thing to be condemned by the word of god and yet not to be condemned by your own heart if we can break the least of the known commandments of god without any self-condemnation it is plain that the god of this world hath hardened our hearts if we do not soon recover from this we shall be past feeling and our consciousness as st paul speaks will be seared as with a hot iron i have now only to add a few important directions the first great point is this suppose we have a tender conscience how shall we preserve it i believe there is only one possible way of doing this which is to obey it every act of disobedience tends to bind and deaden it to put out its eye that it may not see the good and the acceptable will of god and to deaden the heart that it may not feel self-condemnation when we act in opposition to it and in the contrary every act of obedience gives to the conscience a sharper and stronger sight and a quicker feeling of whatever offends the glorious majesty of god therefore if you desire to have your conscience always quick to discern and faithful to accuse or excuse you if you would preserve it always sensible and tender be sure to obey it at all events continually listen to its admonitions and steadily follow them whatever it directs you to do according to the will of god do however grievous to flesh and blood whatever it forbids if the prohibition be grounded on the word of god see you do it not however pleasing it may be to flesh and blood the one or the other may frequently be the case what god forbids may be pleasing to our evil nature there you are called to deny yourself or you deny your master what he enjoins may be painful to nature there take up your cross so true is our lord's word quote, except a man deny himself and take up his cross daily he cannot be my disciple unquote. i cannot conclude this discourse better than with an extract from dr annesley's sermon on universal conscientiousness dr annesley my mother's father was rector of the parish of cripplegate be persuaded to practice the following directions and your conscience will continue right take heed of every sin count no sin small and obey every command with your might watch against the first rising of sin and beware of the borders of sin shun the very appearance of evil venture not upon temptation or occasion of sin consider yourself as living under god's eye live as in the sensible presence of the jealous god remember all things are naked and open before him you cannot deceive him for he is infinite wisdom you cannot fly from him for he is everywhere you cannot bribe him for he is righteousness itself speak as knowing god hears you walk as knowing god besets you on every side the lord is with you while you are with him that is you shall enjoy this favorable presence while you live in his awful presence be serious and frequent in the examination of your heart and life there are some duties like those parts of the body the want of which may be supplied by other parts but the want of these nothing can supply every evening review your carriage through the day what you have done or thought that was unbecoming your character whether your heart has been instant upon religion and indifferent to the world have a special care of two portions of time namely morning and evening the morning to forethink what you have to do and the evening to examine whether you have done what you ought let every action have reference to your whole life and not to a part only let all your subordinate ends be suitable to the great end of your living exercise yourself unto godliness be as diligent in religion as thou wouldst have thy children that go to school be in learning let thy whole life be a preparation for heaven 
like the preparation of wrestlers for the combat do not venture on sin because christ hath purchased a pardon this is a most horrible abuse of christ for this very reason there was no sacrifice under the law for any willful sin lest people should think they know the price of sin as those who deal in popish indulgences be nothing in your own eyes for what is it alas that we have to be proud of our very conception was sinful our birth painful our life toilsome our death we know not what but all this is nothing to the state of our soul if we know this what excuse have we for pride consult duty not events we have nothing to do but to mind our duty all speculations that tend not to holiness are among your superfluities but forebodings of what may befall you in doing your duty may be reckoned among your sins and to venture upon sin to avoid danger is to sink the ship for fear of pirates oh how quiet as well as holy would our lives be had we learned that single lesson to be careful for nothing but to do our duty and leave all consequences to god what madness for silly dust to prescribe to infinite wisdom to let go our work and meddle with god's he hath managed the concerns of the world and every individual person in it without giving cause of complaint to any for above these five thousand years does he now need your counsel nay it is your business to mind your own duty what advice you would give to another take yourself the worst of men are apt enough to lay burdens on others which if they would take on themselves they would be rare christians do nothing of which you cannot pray for a blessing every action of a christian that is good is sanctified by the word and prayer it becomes not a christian to do anything so trivial that he cannot pray over it and if he would but bestow a serious ejaculation on every occurrent action such a prayer would cut off all things sinful and encourage all things lawful think and speak and do what you are persuaded christ himself would do in your case were he on earth it becomes a christian rather to be an example to all who was and is and ever will be our absolute pattern o oh, christians how did christ pray and redeem time for prayer how did christ preach out of whose mouth proceeded no other but gracious words what time did christ spend in impertinent discourse how did christ go up and down doing good to men and what was pleasing to god i commend to you these four memorials one mind duty two what is the duty of another in your case is your own three do not meddle with anything if you cannot say the blessing of the lord be upon it for above all sooner forget your christian name than forget to eye christ whatever treatment you meet with from the world remember him and follow his steps who did not sin neither was guile found in his mouth who when he was reviled reviled not again but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously end of section fifty two